Hello everyone, Philip Shields here. Many of you seeing the sermon title probably wonder why I'm going to have to talk about it, why I've chosen this topic to talk about. This is about a beautiful day, the Day of Atonement. It's so beautiful. Beautiful day. Lovely day. Today though, I want to focus on one aspect. I hope the final time I have to do it. One aspect of the Day of Atonement, which means coverings, or Yom Kippur. Yom means day and Kippur means covering. And actually, several times it's called Kippurim, plural. So it's a day of coverings because so many things were covered and cleansed by the blood of the ram and even the bull. Uh, but anyway, so for the full explanation on the entire day of atonement, see the video of uh, 2021. I may have a new one for 2022, but I also have a sermon to prepare for the feast. Anyway, many of you already know that Yom Kippur, Yom Kippur, on the Day of Atonement, Day of Covering, is all about Jesus, our Savior. So why am I bringing up Satan? The title says, Proving Satan has no part in the Day of Atonement. Why the Azazel Goat cannot be Satan. Why am I talking about Satan on such a beautiful day as today? I'm giving this talk because still so many especially those from the Church of God groups, believe and teach that one of the two goats featured in Leviticus 16 pictures Satan of all things. So a large portion of their sermon time is spent talking about Satan on this day of all days. It's been taught for decades. It's very, very hard for some to give up. I used to teach it that way too. I've kept the Day of Atonement for over 50 years. So I'm addressing it because now to me it's unthinkable on a day that has to do with atoning blood of God's Son and sin being disposed of, God's great love for humanity, that Satan, had, our adversary, should be mentioned at all. Hi again, I'm Philip Shields, founder and host of Light on the Rock. Thank you for coming. Uh, please register. Please be aware we have blogs, we have audio sermons, we have video sermons, we have pictures. If after hearing this message you can think of others who need to hear it, please pass it on without editing it, please. Please pass it on. The truth must get out. The Day of Atonement should only be about glorifying our Savior and King Jesus and no distractions, glorifying Jesus, glorifying our Father, the wonderful plan of salvation for all humanity who accept their invitation. Now, for a more complete picture of Yom Kippur, you might try my full sermon. Uh, look up Day of Atonement 2021, and hopefully it will pop up for you. Just use the search bar. You may want your Bible open to Leviticus 16 so you can follow along, or you might want to just print the notes out and, and follow along. I, I would recommend the notes and the audio. Sometimes I say things in the audio that aren't in the notes and vice versa. <clears throat> so you understand what this is all about. The main characters on this day are the high priest, a bull that was sacrificed as a burnt offering for him and his family, and two kids of goats. One was sacrificed, blood was shed, it was killed, and its blood was sprinkled to cleanse. By the way, there's nothing in Leviticus 16 that on that first goat, this might be important, the one that was killed, there's nothing said that any sins were transferred to it. I believe the reason is, I heard a very good sermon from David Graby about this, portion, this part of it. He gave a great sermon on it. But on the Day of Atonement, you know, if you come in with all the sins of the nation and the people uh, being transferred to a sin offering, and then the blood from that sprinkled here and there on the horns of the altar in different places, you're bringing in basically sin before God. So on this day, God wanted to cleanse everything. So there was no pronouncement of the sins on that first goat. That's very important to understand. So it was there for cleansing the altar and the horns and the, 
the the Ark of the Covenant, and different things. Uh, there, so there were still sins that had to be pronounced, and so, so you needed the second goat to have those sins pronounced on it, and it was a goat of departure. What Azazel means is departure, removal, and it was sent out. But what I've just said about the first goat, that no, there's nothing in Leviticus 16 that says any sins were pronounced over it. <clears throat> the second goat, called in English the scapegoat, in your Leviticus 16, is a terrible translation of the Hebrew word Azazel, which means goat of removal or departure, as even several translations put it. The question comes up a lot, why are there two goats if they both represent Jesus? I may have just answered that. But there's actually were quite a number of other sacrificial animals, quite a number offered on that day. So the why the two goats question or alibi really uh, does not hold water, bear water here, it carries no weight, was not at all limited to two goats, one bull. You can read about the animals that were sacrificed on the Day of Atonement, the tenth day of the seventh month of the Hebrew month, in Numbers 29, verses 7 to 11. I'll put the scriptures in the notes. But <clears throat> if today we afflict our souls, we fast. You shall present a burnt offering to the Lord as a sweet aroma, one young bull, one ram, seven lambs. So, okay, so why were there seven lambs? Why was there one ram? Why was there one bull if they all pictured Christ? Because Christ encompasses such a broad, complete, and total cleansing of our sins that it takes a lot to picture all aspects of it. There's also grain offering, verse 9 and 10. And verse 11, also a kid of the goats as a sin offering besides the sin offering for atonement. So, I mean, there's all kinds of animals being mentioned here. The regular burnt offerings as well with its grain offerings and their drink offerings. So the notion that there were two goats and therefore what they were and they were representing two different personalities. I'm going to show you as we go through here. No, only one personality is mentioned, is is used, is what it's about in on this day of atonement. Only one personality. And that is the one who became Jesus Christ. And I'll show you that without question, I think by the time you're done here. So a lot of animals are sacrificed. What's interesting, too, is that the book of Hebrews, which addresses this day of atonement in Hebrews 9, talking about the one day that the high priest could go into the Holy of Holies. Satan is never mentioned. The second goat is never mentioned. The Azazel is never mentioned in the book of Hebrews. Certainly Satan isn't. In the whole Bible, never once is Satan identified by the name Azazel. Not a single time. Nowhere. That's all supposition. That's all jumping to conclusions that people have done. So the reason for this sermon and its notes is that the Church of God, the Seventh-day Keepers Church of God, I don't mean the Pentecostal ones, um, Many pastors still teach that the scapegoat, or the Azazel, the goat of removal, who has all the sins of Israel pronounced on its head and laid on it, picture Satan. Now, after teaching this for almost a decade or more, I, 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 I really, really upsets me because, true to his form, Satan's trying to steal the glory that belongs to Yeshua, to Jesus. I'm hoping this teaching, I want to have it in my in my list of sermons so in future years I don't have to spend time talking about Satan I shouldn't have to on the Day of Atonement it's not about him so if what I say today is correct then that means scores of ministers are ascribing to Satan what belongs solely to God and that is so serious so evil so dark I realize they are teaching as they were taught as they believe it but it's wrong it's not a small matter I'm saddened and discouraged by how many ministers will spend most of their sermon time on the Day of Atonement talking about, of all people, of all beings, Satan, instead of our Savior Jesus Christ. Probably 80% or more of their sermons about him. And I used to do it too. 
I had to lay my head down one year, some years ago, and I finally really came to understand it. I had to lay my head down, face on the bedroom carpet, bowing before my holy God, begging him for his forgiveness, for teaching God could share his exclusive atoning love, his exclusive mercies for us all, that he could share that with, of all beings, the adversary. I did it in ignorance, but that ignorance had to stop. So you'll see today that to teach Satan is a zazo is to teach that he shares in the titles of the Son of God, the remover of our sins, the redeemer, the savior. That's not going to happen with me. So I want to have the sermon in my list of sermons so I can just say, hey, listen to that sermon I gave in 2022. Uh, going forward, I don't want to talk about Satan that much. And I don't want to give him the time of day. And so now, especially now that we have in the news that five red heifers, these are killed, and then the ashes from the red heifers are used in cleansing the priests and the temple grounds and so on. They're getting ready, folks, over there for something big. Five red heifers have arrived in Israel to use their ashes eventually to cleanse the priests. There are, there's a whole team, documented descendants of Aaron, priests, the tribe of Levi, descendants of Aaron, who are already finishing their training, practicing their roles in all the matters pertaining to priests. So this could get very interesting the next three or four years. I believe the main reason that people believe the Azazel goat of removal is Satan is because that's what's taught in chapter 10, I think it is, of the book of Enoch, a book that was not written by Enoch, was written between 200 and 100 BC. In fact, there are three books of Enoch, so we call this First Enoch, or book one. But neither was this book ever accepted as being inspired, even though there are some truths in it. It's not all truth, so it could not be added to the canon of inspired scripture. Just because Jude quotes something spoken by Enoch, and he did not say written by Enoch, is not proof by itself that the so-called book of Enoch is inspired. Paul also quoted from a pagan poet or prophet. Does that mean everything that guy wrote was inspired? Of course not. That's in Titus chapter 1. Titus chapter 1. Verses 12 to 14, one of them, a prophet of their own, said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. Paul says, this testimony is true. I've been to Crete. I wonder how they like that. Therefore rebuke them sharply, that they may be sound in the faith. Not giving heed. Please listen to this. Not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men who turn from the truth. That's exactly what Yeshua said, exactly what Jesus said. You, you make null and void the commandments of God by your own tradition. Matthew 15, I think it is, verse 6, and, and uh, Mark 7, I think it is. But anyway, um, it's Jewish tradition that talks about Azazel being put into a into a confined space. <clears throat> but you know what? You won't find a single scripture that you can show me or anyone else. I'll pay you $100. If any of you can find me a single scripture where the Bible clearly says that the Azazel is Satan, where the Bible in its original language, Hebrew and Greek, clearly says that the sins that are placed on the Azazel goat mean Satan, has uh, sins placed on him. Show me just one verse, just one verse, just one scripture that clearly says even a single sin is transferred to Satan. You won't be able to because it ain't there. It's not there, folks. I will go by scripture, not from the book of Enoch, not from Jewish lore and fables. They even have the story of a, of a demon in the wilderness called the Zazo. So there's some horrible translations in the ESV, the New, the New Living Translation, I think even Holman. Maybe not Holman, but but uh, the New Living, uh, New Revised Standard. They talk about anyway. I'll talk about it later. It's terrible. Anyway, show me a single verse that says your sins are put on Satan. That he takes our sins far, far away. You won't be able to because they're not in your Bible. But here's what the Bible does say. 
Let's read what really and who really takes our sins away. Psalm 103, verse 12. As far as the east is from the west, so far as he, God Almighty, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Who takes away the sins of the world, takes upon himself and takes them away? John the Baptist, John 1.29, said, John 1.29, the next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. I'm reading scripture, folks, not Book of Enoch. People believe Satan has to accept our sins because they've been brought up to this non-scriptural teaching that also says that Satan is responsible for our sins and therefore deserves to be cast out, totally blamed for everything and put out. Sympathetically, we might say, yeah, he deserves that. And years ago, I, years and years ago, I taught that too, but it's not in the Bible. So I changed, hard though it was at first. If Satan's already responsible for every sin, then why would there need to be a transfer of sins to him if he's already responsible, if he's already bearing our sins? And here's something else. The animal upon which all sins are applied, including that second goat of Azazel, had to be a goat without blemish, had to be faultless, sinless, picturing sinlessness. This was picturing our perfect being who would accept on himself our sins and he could accept other sins because he hadn't. He didn't have to run the penalty for his own sin. He didn't have any. And because he's God, son of God, his one life could take and accept all sin from everybody. His one life was worth it. None of what I've just said can apply to Satan. He was not faultless. He was not without blemish. He was not sinless. If he was to pay for any of, 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 of sins, he'd have plenty of his own. There's no room to carry anybody else's. So could that second goat be without blemish and picture Satan? No way. No way, folks. No way. I'm going to use scripture throughout here now. I'm going to demand scripture be given me if any of you want to prove Azazel is Satan. I want to keep teaching it. Prove it by the Bible, not, not by traditions you've heard. There's no scripture, not a single one, that says those things. Those preaching the Azazel picture Satan also claim he's responsible for all human sin. He, uh, but, but who does scripture say is actually responsible for human sin coming into the world? According to your own Bibles, it's not Satan. Show me a single scripture that says Satan was responsible for every sin. That's not what it says in Romans 5, verse 12 and 19. Romans 5, verse 12 and 19. Romans 5, 12, Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men because all sinned. Verse 19, for as by one man's disobedience, Adam, many were made sinners, so also by one man's disobedient, many will be made righteous. The other one is Jesus Christ. So Paul clearly says the beginning of human sins was with Adam, not Satan. And he blames man, anthropos, where we get the word anthropolo anthropological. <clears throat> anthropos never applies to angelic or spirit beings. As you continue reading Romans 5, we see that Satan is never discussed as being responsible for sin or its removal. So I hope you see we cannot teach Satan's responsible for it, as some teach. And the way out of this is for our sins, in fact, to be placed on Jesus, who became sin for us, became a curse for us. I think the curse for us, I think, is Galatians 3.13. I'm doing that from memory, which is dangerous. I think it's Galatians 3.13. He became a curse for us. He became sin for us. 2 Corinthians 5.21 For he made him, God made him, Jesus, who knew no sin to be sin for us. Not Satan. Jesus was made sin for us. 
that we might become the righteousness of God in him. All our sins are in fact transferred to Jesus, not ever, ever to Satan. Jesus became sin for us. Jesus took our sins away, as John the Baptist said, John 1.29. Takes away the sins of the world. Here's another point. Can someone else, like Satan, other than myself, be punished for my sins or your sins? Make a note to study Ezekiel 18 on your own. It's all about that topic. God says, you guys have an expression that I don't like. I want you to quit using it. Uh, that, what does it say in the beginning of Exodus? I mean, Ezekiel, Ezekiel, if I said Exodus, I mean Ezekiel 18, that uh, the father uh, drinks vinegar or wine or something, sour wine, and the children's teeth are set on edge. He said, no, we're not going to say that anymore because each one's accountable for what he does. So can someone else be punished for my sin? The answer is a resounding no from Ezekiel 18. A child can't be responsible for the sins of his parents. Parents can't be responsible for the sins of the children. So scripture again is clear. Satan cannot be blamed for my sins. Satan may have influenced me to sin, may have even caused me to sin. But as you'll see in Ezekiel 18, God holds each of us responsible for our own sin. The one who sins bears the own guilt. The soul that sins shall die. Ezekiel 18, 4 and 20. Let me, let me in fact come to read that. And remember as we come, as we go further along in here that Jesus, Yeshua, calls Satan the father of sinners. Uh, you know, he, in John 8, 44, you're, you're like your father, the devil. He's a liar and a murderer from the beginning. He, you're like your father. You're just like your father, the devil. Ezekiel 18 makes it very clear. A father cannot take the blame or the penalty for someone else's sin. Jesus even calls Satan our father until we accept God the Father as our father. So in Ezekiel 18.20, so Satan cannot be made to suffer because of our sins. He has plenty to suffer for his own. Ezekiel 18.20, the soul who sins shall die the soul, the son, the son shall not bear, Ezekiel 18, 20, the son shall not bear the guilt of the father, nor the father bear the guilt of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon himself, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon himself. Not upon the father, not upon the son, it's upon himself. Now remember in Genesis 3, Eve tried to blame the serpent for her sinning. Adam tried to blame this woman you gave me. I didn't ask for a woman, you gave me... You know, so I, I, she made me do it. And then the woman said, the devil made me do it. A serpent told me this and that. The devil made me do it, like Flip Wilson used to say. God didn't buy that. Eve had her own penalties to face. And the serpent had his own penalties to face for what he'd done. But not for what Eve had done. Now, only Yeshua. Here's another point. Only Yeshua, only Jesus Christ is shown as bearing our sins. Nowhere is it said that he shares that saving work that is his with anyone else, least of all Satan. 1 Peter 2.24, who himself, about Jesus, who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree. That we having, and he did that, by the way, outside the camp, okay, outside the city. That we having died to sins might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you're healed. Hebrews 9, verse 27, 28. It was appointed to men once to die, to die once, but after this the judgment. So Christ was offered once to bear carry to bear the sins of many. goes on from there. It's very clear, isn't it? So those of you who want to preach Azazel equals Satan, it's your turn now. Show me your verses. Show me your scriptures that say clearly Satan is Azazel and Satan is the one who bears our sins. I'm waiting. I'm waiting. I'm still waiting. Because there's no such verse. 
We've got to quit taking away from Jesus and giving what applies to Jesus to Satan. That's how bad it is. Now, before I forget, there's an even more evil understanding that a few promote. First of all, many teach that Azazel is Satan. They get that mostly from the book of Enoch, chapter 10, the first 12 verses. Enoch 10, verse, uh, chapter 10, verses 1 to 12. It's an apocryphal book that teaches this evil. It says Raphael, an, an angel of God never mentioned that by that name in the scriptures, supposedly binds Azazel, or Azaziel, as the book of Enoch has it, and confines him in a wilderness named Duda, Dudael, covers him in darkness and sharp rocks and all of that. Eventually, the very end of time, his end is in the lake of fire. So there's some similar, similarity with scripture. But this is where the idea of putting all the sins upon him come from. Enoch chapter 10. But the goat of removal, Azazel, is not a name. It's a description in Scripture. It's why I never capitalize Azazel, because it's not about a person. Azazel is about a function, removal, departure. I go by Scripture, which never, in a single verse, ever calls Satan the Azazel goat. Never. But now there's a second more evil teaching. According to Jewish fables, the Kabbalah, and so on, this second goat was sent to, T-O, to, an evil desert spirit named Azazel as a way of assuaging him, satisfying him. How utterly evil that is. And those teaching that are saying God told Israel to Calm down that desert demon out there and send him a goat. Well, demons obey and fear God, fear Jesus. God is above all principality, might, and power, and dominion, and every name that is named, it says in Ephesians 1, I think verse 21. This is a terrible teaching that has made its way into some translations. The New Living, the ESV, the Holman, and the, the New Revised Standard. For example, the ESV says this about Leviticus 16.10, The goat on which the lot fell for Azazel shall be presented alive before the Lord to make atonement over it. Now listen, this is the English Standard Version. This translation right here is so evil that it may be sent away into the wilderness to Azazel. To Azazel. The New Living, also very bad, on this verse. You've got to be careful with the Bible translations. Always go back to the original Hebrew and Greek where you can. The other goat, the scapegoat, okay, I'm reading the New Living translation, Leviticus 16.10. Chosen by lot to be sent away will be kept alive standing before the Lord when, it's, when it is sent away to Azazel in the wilderness the people will be purified and made right with the Lord. That is so evil. In just a few verses after Leviticus 16, when we come to Leviticus 17, verse 7, God says, There shall be no more, they shall no more offer their sacrifices to demons after whom they have played the harlot. This shall be a statute forever throughout their generations. Don't go offering goats and lambs and bulls to demons. So this notion from the New Living and from the ESV and the New Revised is just plain evil translation of that verse. So you see what happens when you start moving away from Scripture from, for your authority and start relying on Judaism, the Kabbalah, and the uh, apocryphal books. I strongly warn many of you in the Hebrew roots and Messianic movements. I used to attend some of those. I'm aware of what's happening in there. I warn you to wake up. Realize that Yeshua and the Apostle Paul often warned against Judaism and traditions of men. I'll put the scriptures in the notes. Matthew 15, 3-6. You have nullified the commandment of God by your tradition. Jesus said, 1 Peter 1.18 says something similar by Peter. Paul says something similar in Galatians 1.14, that he was raised in Judaism and its traditions. But many of you can't even lead a prayer without resorting to ancient Judaism prayers, 
written by rabbis who renounced the Messiah. Why do you do that? I won't. I was attending a Hebrew Roots service one time, and I was asked to come up and lead in prayer. And they gave me the sheet with a Jewish Judaism prayer. And I said, you know, I really think God would much rather hear my heart. He said not to have vain repetitions that are said over and over and over again. So I prayed my own prayer. I won't lead those kinds of prayers. They're not of God. But we have believers in Messiah who believe they have to repeat the same prayers over and over because Jewish rabbis said so long ago, praying over the wine, for example, or over the bread, or over the Sabbath, or over the candles. It's the same blessing over and over, different wording at the end. God would much rather hear your heart, not a vain repetition. Baruch Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam, something like that. Borei Pri Hagafen, something like that. I don't know if I got the tune right. Blessed are you, Adonai, which should be Yehovah or Yahweh, our God, ruler of the universe, who creates the fruit of the vine. Nice words. Yeshua said, you know, one time the, the disciples were listening to Jesus pray, and they said, boy, he's not talking about Baruch Ata Adonai. Uh, and so they went up to him. I think that's probably why they went up to him. And uh, teach us how to pray the way you pray, which is from his heart. The Jewish prayers over, you know, even this uh, Chosen series, when they show praying, they, they often go back to these Jewish prayers. I will, I'm 99% sure Yeshua didn't pray the Jewish prayers. He prayed the prayers from his heart. The Jewish prayers over Sabbath candles, it's not biblical, folks. It comes from Judaism's traditions, condemned both by Yeshua and Paul and Peter. The prayer claims that the lighting of the Shabbat candles comes from one of God's commandments. It does not. That is a lie. It comes from Judaism's traditions, maybe their own commandments, but not from the Holy Scripture. Brothers and sisters in Messiah, please, let's stop it. Pray your heart. It's because of listening too much to Judaism that we have this whole issue of Azazel, I believe thinking that Azazel is about Satan because that's what the Jewish myths say they end up glorifying Satan so I'm gonna so let's stop it the second goat's called Azazel that word means removal departure it's not a name so I never capitalize it it's all small letters it means removal the goat of removal so again Christ became sin for me Christ took all my sins off of me put it on himself and gave me his righteousness The Azazel goat of removal is to bear on itself all their iniquities. Leviticus 16, verses 20 to 22, is to bear on itself all their iniquities, not his own. And when he, the high priest, has made an end of atoning, I, I say that because some people say that he also has to bear his own, has made an end of atoning for the holy place, the tabernacle of meeting, the altar, he shall bring the live goat. Leviticus 16, 21 now. Aaron shall lay both his hands on the head. Now remember, there's nothing in Leviticus 16 that there was any transference, transference of any sin or guilt to the first goat that was killed and whose pure blood, who, which pictured Christ's pure blood, sinless blood, was then brought in and sprinkled. But the sins of the nation had to be pronounced that's why you needed a second goat. And it's not Satan. And when the high priest, okay, Aaron shall lay both his hands on the head of the live goat, confess over it all the iniquities of the children of Israel. So second goat's needed. It's the first time that confessing the sins on the children of the children of Israel on the goat are mentioned and all their transgressions concerning all their sins. So the other goat forgave the sins, but the sins were not confessed to it, were not transferred to it. So you needed a second goat concerning all their sins, putting them on the head of the goat, shall send it away by the wilderness, into the wilderness by the hand of a fit or suitable man. 
the goat shall bear on itself all their iniquities to an uninhabited land. I've already read you the scriptures about how Jesus bore on himself, and Peter, Jesus bore on himself all of our sins on the cross. Right? 1 Peter 2.24 He himself bore our sins in his own body. So who in Scripture is identified as bearing? 1 Peter 2.24 And so many more. Jesus did. Show me one single verse that says Satan bears our iniquities. You won't find it. Because it's a terrible, terrible lie. I'm not trying to be nice anymore about this. You ministers who preach that Azazel is Satan, you need to listen to this, check it for yourself, humble yourself, and do what I did years ago. Get your head on the ground and beg God for forgiveness for this. And acknowledge your mistake like I've acknowledged mine. Satan's trying to steal credit from Jesus Christ. So who bears all our iniquities? Speaking of the righteous servant in Isaiah 53, verses 5 and 6. You can start in verse 4 if you want, but I'll read from 5 and 6. And also 11, 12 of this same chapter. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. And by his stripes we were healed. And we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him, this righteous servant of God, picturing Jesus Christ. Isaiah 53, verse 6. The Lord has laid on Satan. No, no, no. The Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. It's so clear, isn't it? And how can Satan be involved in anything to do with atoning for sins? Folks, that's, an entirely, that's entirely the role of Jesus Christ. No one else. Leviticus 16.10 The goat on which the lot fell to be the scapegoat, to be the azazel, the goat of removal. As Young's literal translation puts it that way, the goat of departure. Anyway, it shall be presented alive before the Lord to make atonement upon it. How on earth can we make atonement upon Satan? He has no business with atonement. None. And to let it go as the azazel, the go to departure into the wilderness. Let me read that from Young's literal translation. And the goat on which the lot for a goat of departure, that's your scapegoat, azazel, for a goat of departure hath gone up as cause to stand before the living Jehovah, to make atonement by it. It does say Jehovah here, Jehovah. There's no J in Hebrew. To make atonement by it, to send it away by for a goat of departure. Why are we departing? Because God wants to take away our sins and he wanted all of Israel to see. They didn't see the goat being killed and the blood being splattered here and there. They couldn't. They all in, On this day, they had to all stay in their tents. They had to all stay in their tents. But when they got this other goat, there were many more who would have heard the pronouncement of all sins on it, and thousands probably would have seen the fit man, the suitable man, leading it out of the camp. And the word would have gone very excitedly through the camp. All of our sins are on that crazy goat. That would have been a great source of joy. They didn't see the first goat. This one they got to see. And it says here again, uh, Revelation 6, uh, Leviticus 16.10, to make atonement upon it. But in Psalm 65, verse 3, Psalm 65, verse 3, it says, And the goat on which the lot fell for a goat of... No, wait, wait. Psalm 65, verse 3. Iniquities prevail against me as for our transgression. This is David talking about God. You, you, God, will provide atonement for them. There's not a single verse that says Satan provides atonement for us. 
You can tell me what you think. You can tell me what tradition says. You can tell me what Book of Enoch says, the Kabbalah says. Show me a verse. It angers me that we ministers who should know better are teaching this falsehood. God, you will provide atonement for them. Psalm 65, 3. Because remember Leviticus 16 says that this goat of departure shall be presented alive before the Lord to make atonement upon it. Satan can't do that. So you see, Azazel is not the name of a being. It's a function. The goat of removal. Scapegoat is such a horrible translation. In the New Century Version, they have an uh, interesting way of writing out Leviticus 16.10. The other goat, the second goat, which was chosen by Lot to remove the sin, must be brought alive before Yehovah. Here again they have Yehovah. The priest will use it to perform the acts that remove Israel's sin for atonement. So they, Israel, will belong to Yehovah. Then this goat will be sent out into the desert as a goat that removes sin. Picturing Jesus removing our sin as far as the east is from the west. Psalm 103, verses, I think verse 12. Another point, Hebrews 8 and 9 discusses the Day of Atonement, especially chapter 9, Hebrews 9, and the high priest's role. I mentioned this earlier, I want to say it again. Never, ever, once, never even once, is the word or name Satan or Zazel ever mentioned in the book of Hebrews. I think 14 other New Testament books mention Satan. The book of Hebrews never once in the whole book mentions him. If he's so important on this day, when the guy writing the book of Hebrews, whether that was Paul or whoever it was, was discussing this day, you would think if it was so important that Satan has such a big part that our ministers are using 80% or more of their speaking time about him, that he'd be mentioned. He's not. The second goat, in fact, isn't discussed at all. You'd think that because of the importance that ministers place on the second goat, I mean, frankly, the major importance should be on the first goat, the blood. And by that blood, representing the pure blood of Yeshua, that by his own blood he was able to cleanse the heavenly things. That's what it says in Hebrews 9. He doesn't mention Satan at all in the entire book of Hebrews. Now how about Revelation 20, verses 1 to 3? There, after Christ's return, is nothing said there that this is a day of atonement. Nothing. Satan is bound and placed into an abyss, the bottomless pit, for a thousand years. Presumably his demons as well, but they're not mentioned, but presumably. That is not at all like Leviticus 16 being released into a wilderness. Many, many of us use Revelation 20 to fit the narrative of Book of Enoch and Judaism's explanation of the Azazel goat. They're not the same. Revelation 20 doesn't say that it happened on it might have been might be the very very next day after Christ returns and lands on the Mount of Olives, maybe the same day. Cast out the mocker, strife will cease. There's a Proverbs that says that. Cast out the mocker and strife shall cease. He's the troublemaker. So he's got to get rid of him. There's no mention in Revelation 20 of a single sin being pronounced over Satan's head before he's confined to the abyss, the bottomless pit. Not a single sin is mentioned. Revelation 20, it's a leap to say that that's about the Leviticus 16 Azazel goat. It doesn't sound like it at all except those who believe that Satan has to be led away and confined. Well, boy, that's a convenient scripture to try to, you know, make them fit together. Here's another point. Goats and sacrificial animals presented for sacrifice to God 
had to be, I kind of said it already, let me say it again, had to be without visible blemish, depicting perfect sinlessness, depicting innocence. So the blood of this innocent animal, picturing Christ, has to take, has to die because of what you did and because of what I did. Both goats in Leviticus 16 had to be like that. Both goats had to be blameless, without blemish, innocent. Deuteronomy 17, 1 says, God says, don't ever offer me something that has a blemish. An innocent goat. And he said that because he's not, not that he's being picky, but because he's being picky in that <laughs> the bull or the goat or whatever it is has to picture his son. An innocent goat or sheep was selected to bear the sins of someone guilty. And then the sins of that guilty person were transferred to the head of the innocent animal. And then the innocent animal was either killed or on a day of atonement also led away. In no way could either goat picture be pictured by Satan. Innocent. Guiltless. In what nightmare or dream would any of us have where we could say that Satan, the dragon of old, the serpent of old, was innocent? Ugly creature that he is. He once was beautiful. I don't think he's beautiful now. Sin Sin destroys. He was a liar from the beginning, a murderer from the beginning. Do you see how far off base the teaching is? That Satan is what the Azazel goat pictured. Now a little more about the book of Enoch, the single best source for this very false teaching, that Azazel is a being, that is Satan, because I just so adamantly have proven that Azazel cannot be Satan. This one point by itself also lays its hand against the book of Enoch being reliable. There are things in it that are true. Jude thought so. Thousands of his saints shall come and so on. I think that's in Enoch chapter 1. And that our sins are placed on Satan's head, contrary to scripture. No, I can't accept that. Book of Enoch also claims, now can you accept this? that the Nephilim giants of the pre-flood world were 300 cubits tall. A cubit that they use is the shorter 18-inch cubit, not the 22-inch one, that puts them at over 442 feet tall, 137 meters tall. Really? Any of you believe giants were as high as a 44-story building? Or if they were lying down on the ground, that they would stretch out the entire length of a football field, American football field, plus a third more. A football field 300 feet long, 100 yards. This guy's, they're saying that the, the Nephilim were 442 feet tall. Somehow those giants were having sex with pre-flood women. They would have been killing the women to even try to do anything sexually. You know that. I'm speaking bluntly, but that's ridiculous. Because of that point alone, when I read that in the book of Enoch, I said, okay, I can't accept that. And I certainly can't accept that Azazel is Satan. It had a correct statement here and there, but Jude quoted from Enoch's words, not his written words. But that didn't justify the whole book. So those of you who love the book of Enoch and base your, some of your teachings on that have a decision to make. Do you accept the book of Enoch is teaching about Azazel as Satan and want to take away from the glory of Jesus Christ? That all sins are placed on Satan's head? That Satan takes them out? Or do you accept that script, what Scripture says that I've shown you which, and which I'll clearly show you here today? I have clearly shown. And of course this is one point by itself that makes me not accept the book of Enoch as, a script, as part of Scripture. One day I have to give a whole sermon on Enoch and also show other doctrinal errors that it has. Anyway, please, please, brethren, wake up, all of you. Who, if you accept that Azazel is Satan or your minister is teaching that, he's wrong. Very, very wrong. Satan does not take a single one of my sins upon himself, nor does he march him out of camp, nor is he, nor is he responsible. 
for my sins. I'm only responsible for my sins. So my challenge for many years seems unanswered. Show me one verse that Satan is a zazzle. Show me in scripture even one time that says our sins are put on Satan and he takes them away. No, Jesus does. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John 1, 29. Isaiah 53, 6. And God laid upon him the, the iniquities of us all. Show me one verse that Satan is responsible for our sins. Ezekiel 18 says, no, we're responsible for each of our own sins. Romans 5.12 says, sin entered the world because of Adam, not Satan. Show me where Satan is even mentioned in the book of Hebrews 9, or anywhere in the book, about this day. Not a single word about Satan. But Jesus sure has talked about. Because this beautiful day is about Jesus, our Savior. It's about what he's done and how he took his blameless, sinless life and took upon himself all of our sins so that when he comes back down to earth, the wrath of God is finished. When he lands on the Mount of Olives, the wrath of God is finished. That wrath that lasts for, for, for a year. And I believe we, the bride of Christ, along with Christ himself, will go to the nations and say, look, we, the bride, were people just like you. We had sin. But we confessed our sins and repented. And your king, our king, the king of kings, was our savior. That's what his name means, Yeshua, savior. And because of that, he took away all of our sins. Till when he looked on us, he saw no sin. Who He saw no sin. But in fact, what he did was he gave us his righteousness. 2 Corinthians 5.21, Philippians 3, verses 8 to 11, Romans 5, verse 17. The gift of God's righteousness. It's a gift that too many of you don't speak about. Or understand, I talk about God's righteousness. Put that in the search bar. You've got to learn that. And we'll be able to go to the whole world and say, you can be like us, forgiven, cleansed, starting new, blessed. Come and do it. And we will lead them to salvation and repentance in that millennial time. And they will put all their sins upon Yeshua. And he died once, and that was enough for all time, for all sins of the past, for all sins in the future, will be able to be placed on him, and his one death will last forever for all of us. What a beautiful day this means. It's a day of atonement, a day when the whole world can be atoned for, when the whole world can come to Christ, when the whole world can be taught by us, the bride of Christ. It's an exciting day. So this holy day, Yom Kippur, day of covering, covering sin. Such a beautiful day of God, working hard on this day, sanctifying, cleansing, purifying. You know, they were told, none of you better do any work on atonement because that's the work of the high priest. The high priest worked his, well, he, he worked himself completely down on this day. A lot of work killing a bull, killing a ram, killing seven lambs, killing a, a kid of the goats. And that white tunic that he was wearing by the end of the day, I'm sure was just soaking with blood. That's okay. It's the high priest who worked hard High priest pictured Jesus Christ, our present high, high priest, to sanctify, to cleanse, to cover, to purify, to accept us and carry our sins upon himself. It's all his work. And please, let's stop sharing the work of Christ with Satan of all people. It's so wrong. It's so bad. Let's glorify Christ alone on this day. Satan has no part in it. Bow your heads, please. Father in heaven, our great God. What a... 
What an awesome God you are. Father, I don't deserve, none of us deserve to come to you. We've all been sinful. But your son, our Savior, <clears throat> your son, our Savior, came to earth, lived a perfect life, and then took upon himself all of your wrath, took upon himself the separation that we caused from you, took upon himself the penalty, took upon himself the pain and the shame of sin. We glorify you, Father. We glorify you, Jesus, Yeshua, Savior, we praise your name, especially on Day of Atonement. Hallelujah. Praise you. We ask now that you live in us, fill us with your Holy Spirit, put on your righteousness on us. We are to be clothed with you. We are to put on Christ as a covering. Yeshua, that's what we want to do. Jesus, please cover us. Be our life. Live anew in us. Change us. And most of all, Jesus, thank you. Thank you. And help us spread the word that all sins are placed on you and you gladly take our sins and walk them out of the camp. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Father. Open the minds of those who still think that Azazel is Satan. Oh, God, open their minds. Let them humble themselves, acknowledge the error, and repent, and start teaching the truth, as I had to do as well. We praise you now in Jesus' name. Amen.